Well, good evening. Welcome to our service tonight. I trust you had a restful day. It sure was a sunny and warm one. Tomorrow, I hear, is even warmer yet. Amen? 488 is where we're going to turn and where we're going to sing, My Redeemer. Is he your Redeemer? Amen. Amen. So you'll be able to sing this from your heart. Amen? All right, let's stand. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel will cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. in that song amen he paid my debt and made me free and i hope you can sing that from the heart all right thank you for being here tonight brother dave would you lead us in a word of prayer please You may be seated. Pastor Pooley will come and lead us in our next song. Okay, let's turn to number 326. 326. As we sing more about Jesus. We're going to sing more about Jesus, but we're going to sing the hymn more about Jesus. Amen. And so let's, that's 326. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses. Oh 
more about Jesus. More of his coming, Prince of Peace. Are you looking forward to that? Amen. And, and uh, some great theology in this. It's uh, on the second verse, it says, More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. We come to hear the word of God. And praise the Lord, we have a servant of God here to, to preach the word, but... We shouldn't just come to hear the preacher, but come to hear what the Spirit of God would have for us, right? And so, more about Jesus, and the Spirit can teach us more about Jesus, right? Let's turn to number 316, 316. Oh, to be like thee, I trust that is your desire. That is the role model, right? Our role model is to be like Jesus. Jesus is the role model. Let's sing the first, the third, and the last. spirit we need to be filled with his love and we need to be made a temple meet for his dwelling right mm -hmm. and part of that involves dealing with sin right and thankfully Christ died for our sins right, right. but as we observe the Lord's table tonight we are commanded to examine ourselves right and make sure that there's no unconfessed sins that need to be dealt with that will harm our fellowship with God. And so, oh, to be like thee, well, we want to be meet for his dwelling, right? And we need to be fit for life, so fit to, to serve him here. And, uh, and 
He'll have us fit for heaven above. Are you excited about that? Amen. I trust that you are. Oh, to be like thee, to be like Jesus, right? Let's have a look at our announcements. And so coming up this week, Lord willing, Wednesday, we'll have our midweek prayer and Bible study at 7 o'clock. So be sure to join us for that. And uh, we dealt with birthdays and anniversaries this morning, okay? So if you notice an error in the bulletin, it's... It's known, it's going to be dealt with, check in next Sunday, okay? I heard somebody got in trouble because there's a birthday in June, and uh, they put June birthdays in, they didn't even write, realize that they didn't put this person's birthday in, so, ooh, I won't, I, I won't go any further into details on that, but we're going to, it's been, it's being taken care of, Okay. Sometimes we wonder how many people read the bulletins, and, and you always know how many people read the bulletins when you find out all the mistakes that were made. So <laughs> We don't need to ask. I believe that's all we have for announcements, right? Okay. Well, let's turn to number 332. 332. I trust that as we sing this, this comes from your heart as you sing... My Jesus, I love thee. 332, we'll stand together as we sing. First, second, and last verses, and on the fourth verse we'll have our men come. 332.
We'll read from the first verse. Jesus says here, let, your, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we, not, uh, we, not, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Now these are really incredible words that the Lord Jesus speaks here in this passage when he makes clear that he is the way. And I want to take a look at a few things that we see in that single verse there as we consider the Lord Jesus Christ. We consider the sacrifice that he's made on the cross of Calvary. We consider tonight being the Lord's table and the elements that we have before us and that we will partake of point to these things. As Jesus speaks to his disciples here, and of course we have Thomas, it's interesting that Thomas would speak up and ask this question, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Later on, Thomas will be the one when he is not present. Jesus appears unto them before his resurrection, and he, uh, he has r risen from the grave, hasn't ascended into heaven, and Thomas will be the one that, who's not there, will say, well, unless I see the wound in his hands and the wound on his feet, he says, I will not believe. And of course, Jesus says that it is better to believe by faith without seeing than to wait and see and be proven. Is, is, and I'm not quoting the scriptures there, but that's the message that Jesus had for them. And so it's interesting that Thomas here will ask the question, how can we know the way? Jesus had been trying to teach them and show them through the time that he ministered and taught the disciples the very way. So he says here, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What was Jesus saying when he said that he was the way? When Jesus declares that here, basically he is saying that he was the roadway or the pathway. You've probably heard that statement before where uh, individuals have said that, well, you know, there are many paths to God. I grew up in rural Nova Scotia and we spent a lot of time playing and trekking through the woods and uh, fishing and all that sort of thing that a young boy does in rural Nova Scotia. And so we, we had a lot of paths through the woods, and we had you know, favorite spots that we'd like to go to, and we would take those various paths to get there. I remember my uncles telling me. They, in, the, in their off-season, they were fishermen, and so in the off-season, they would... Uh, 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 what's the word I'm thinking of there, they would uh, put themselves out for hire as guides to people from the city. Individuals would come down and want a good place to go fishing or something like that, and uh, they would offer themselves uh, because they knew that forest area down there by like the back of their hand, and so they would, uh, you know, hire themselves out. And some of these folks from the city would think, well, we'll go down and we'll hire them once or twice, and we will find the way to get to the best fishing spots, and then we won't need them anymore. But they had many paths to get to the same place. They would take them, each time they would come, they would take them a different way. And, of course, so then they would not know the way. They would be confused. 
But when it comes to the Scriptures, Jesus makes it very clear that there is only one way. And he is that way. That's what he was stating here. I am the way. I am the roadway. I am the pathway. And in order to get to God, <clears throat> Jesus says, you must follow me. These things are the very symbols of what Jesus was directing them to. Blood had to be shed. The body had to be broken for people to have access and to be able to get to God. And so Jesus says, follow me. Look at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, and you look at verse 34. It says, And when he had called the people unto him and his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and do what? And follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus makes it clear that if they want it the way, they want it the pathway, if they want it to know, Thomas says, how can we know the way? Jesus says, hey, I am the way. And if I am the way, then follow me. Follow me to the crucifixion. Follow me to the cross and follow me to the death. Now what's amazing is Jesus, Scripture says he made that payment, right? We follow him, but he's the one that made the sacrifice. We don't have to go to the cross. All the wages of sin is what? Death. We deserve death and we should be the ones on the cross, but Jesus made the payment. But spiritually, we follow him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection by putting our faith and trust in him. He made the official payment. He shed his blood. He broke his body and made the payment for us on our behalf. Jesus says, I am the way. He is the roadway. He is the pathway. Not only when he states that he is the way marks the fact that he is the pathway, but it also indicates to us that he is the vehicle or the means to heaven, the means to get to God. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, now, what was the role of the high priest in the Old Testament system? That's right. To intercede on the people of God. The people brought the sacrifices to the temple. The high priest took that blood of the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled it on the, the uh, Holy of Holies, the, the, the altar and the mercy seat, and he interceded on behalf of God. That was their access to God. They couldn't walk into the, the, the temple. They couldn't just walk into the Holy of Holies. They would be destroyed if they even attempted that. Even the high priest had to be in a right standing before God before he went into the Holy of Holies. But it says here, for Christ is not entered into the holy place without... Oh, I'm sorry. But Christ, verse 11, I looked across the page being come an high priest of good things to come. He is our high priest. He has replaced that need for us to go to the temple and bring our sacrifices and offerings to the priest, which was taken to the high priest, because Jesus has become our high priest. It says, He has come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for who? For us. Yeah, he's obtained eternal redemption for us. He has bought us back from sin, and that's what these things represent represents the fact that he as our high priest not only is the intercessor taking the offering of himself, but he is also the offering. He is the sacrifice. He is the, the lamb that was slain and the blood that was shed. Jesus Christ did that for us that we might have access to God. Jesus says, I am the way. He's making it clear that he's both the pathway and the means the vehicle that allows us access into heaven. So we can't say we're going to get there our own way. We can't say, well, I will find my path. No, we must follow his path and his way. And these items, these elements that we partake in, point to that pathway, amen? He says, I am the way. Let's go back. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. And the next element we see here is his, he says, I am the truth. He is the truth. When Jesus makes that statement, a couple of things can be inferred by that. And one is this, if he is the truth, then we can trust his way. You know, when we uh, set out to trust individuals, if they tell us the truth, we trust them. Amen? If we find out that an individual is has lied to us or not given us the correct information, then guess what? We don't trust that. Have you ever been on a trip and asked for directions for something and someone's told you, yeah, if you go down here and do this, this, and that, and you follow their directions and you discover, no, that's not the way to get there, then guess what? You're not going to go back to that same place to ask for directions again, are you? Because you can't trust them. You can't trust the information, right? But Jesus is the truth. He speaks the truth. He's revealed the truth to us. And we can trust what Jesus says. And so we can trust his way. When Jesus made the, the declaration here, I am the way, we, didn't, we don't have to doubt it. Thomas didn't have to be doubting Thomas, right? We could say, well, if Jesus said it, we know it's true, and therefore we can trust it. We can trust that this way is going to be the way to God every single time. Amen? Because he is the truth. Not only does it infer that we can trust his way, but we can trust his word. He not only speaks the truth, but Jesus Christ is the very embodiment of truth. That's why in John chapter 1, if you turn to the beginning of John there. And in those first, these first couple of verses are so key to us really understanding Jesus Christ. Because he says, in the beginning was the, the word, that word, word there, logos, is referring to Jesus Christ. And you noticed in this statement here, it doesn't say that he spoke the word in the beginning. No, he was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ himself was the very Word of God. Everything about him, his, his actions, his will, his plan, the work that he came to do was all part of revealing God's Word to us, because he was the Word. And if he's God's word, guess what? He is the truth. And so that's why he says, I am the way, I am the truth. And therefore, we can trust it. There doesn't need to be any doubt. We don't have to search any further. We don't have to do any other comparison by other ways. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth. Thirdly, he says, I am the life. He is the life. Look, if you will, at John chapter 6.
John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, starting in verse 47, Verily, verily, Jesus says here, I say unto you, it's interesting that word there, verily, verily, means what? Truly, that's right. And he doesn't just say truly, he says truly, truly. In other words, Jesus has repeated himself here, guess what, it must be true. Truly, truly, he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath, what? Everlasting life. You know, that's a, that's a wonderful encouragement, or it ought to be a wonderful encouragement to us. Because it's not just that we're looking forward to being in heaven, but we have everlasting life, not everlasting death. The scriptures say that we'll either live into eternity by trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior, or as we won't look there, but in John 3, 17 and 18, it says, all those that have not believed are what? Condemned already to eternal death. We don't always like to say that or declare, but that's the truth of the Scriptures, is either you will live in eternal death or you will live in eternal life. And Jesus is the one that gives us both the access, the way, and offers to us eternal life. He says here in verse 48, I am that bread of life. He says, he that believeth on me hath the everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which will I give, which... which I will give for the life of the world. You know, that points directly to the elements we have in this cup here, represented by these pieces of bread that have been broken and placed into this cup for us to consume. You know, it's, it's symbolic of the bread that was Jesus Christ, and he's not talking about physically eating his body or eating his flesh. That would have been offensive to the Jews of the day. He was speaking spiritually. We eat of the bread of the Lord Jesus Christ by believing in him and living out Christ in our lives each and every day. His bread points to the fact that he is the living bread. He said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And verse 52, the Jews there, therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So even those that were present in their minds right away, when Jesus says, I am uh, it, those that eat of this flesh, eat of me, eat of the, you know, my bread, and right away they are offended. How can he give us his flesh to eat? And then Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood have eternal life, and I will raise him up. At the last day, <clears throat> for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever." Now look down in verse 60. It says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Even his disciples are puzzled by what Jesus says. And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? He knew that it would. He says, What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up, to where he was before, he said, it is the what? The spirit that quickeneth. And that's what's key to Jesus' whole message here. The bread he was talking about was 
his spiritual flesh. The flesh was to be given, sacrificed on the cross at Calvary, and then, of course, buried and rose again. We eat of that flesh by <coughs> accepting his, his atonement on the cross on our behalf. He said, it's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, he says, and they are life. It goes back to the previous thing we noted there when he said, he is the truth. I am the way, I am the truth. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, Jesus was referring to eating of his flesh spiritually by accepting his payment on the cross of Calvary to give us that eternal life. He was and he is the life. He is the bread of, bread of life, that bread that gives us eternal life. And then number four, if you go back to the passage, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then number four, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's also the door to heaven. There is no pearly gates that we will have to speak to some individual and beg and plead with them to get access into heaven. We only have Jesus to go through. If you look at John chapter 10, John chapter 10, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the what? The door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. There's only one individual that determines whether we get in or we don't get into heaven, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I am the door, he says. I am the access to God. And the only one that we need to speak to is Jesus Christ. And, of course, he's determined right now who's getting into heaven or not based upon whether we've put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There's not going to be any last-minute pleading with Jesus. We're not going to come to the end of our life and determine, well, I don't know if I'm getting into heaven or not, and going to Jesus and begging and plead with him and, and giving our, him our case to argue that, look what I've done, Jesus. No, that's not going to be the case because it all boils down to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ accepting him as the way, the truth, and the life, accepting the broken body, accepting the shed blood on our behalf. He's made the way. The question is, will we follow him? Will we choose his way? Have we chosen his way? We're here tonight to partake in these elements, and that's what these elements remind us of, is that our relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ is based upon what Jesus did. He is the way, truth, and the life. No man cometh unto his Father except through him. As we sit here and gather tonight, I trust that most of us, if not all of us, have already trusted Jesus Christ our Savior. And he is our access, and we know without a shadow of a doubt.
Of course, this is also a time for us to draw our attention to these things. It's also a time for us to come to God and have a cleansing of the account, if you like. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, as informed by Jesus Christ and taught by Jesus, says here, in verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You now we come together because of the sweet fellowship. This represents the relationship we have got with God. It represents the fellowship that we have one with another as children of God. And so as we taken these elements tonight to remind us of that sweet fellowship, of the price and the cost that was given for us to have that relationship. Let us also use this time to make sure that we have confessed unknown sin and that we've removed any barriers between us and God. And so as we take these elements, as Paul says here, let a man examine himself. We will begin with the sharing of the bread, I'm going to ask Brother Albert if he would pray for the bread. But as we usually do, we'll take a few moments and just quietly pray to the Lord and ask the Lord to show us those things. And maybe there's things we don't even realize, but it's a chance for the Holy Spirit to take those things to the Lord on our behalf. And so, Brother Albert, would you lead in a word of prayer after we have a few moments of silence? Take your hymn books, we will turn to 125, Jesus Paid It All. I hear the Savior say, 
Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow, for nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Paul writes here in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. We have this bread that we have now shared with you, a bread that represents his broken body. And it says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. We are called to the fact that this is done in remembrance. It's symbolic. There's no mystical power in these elements. So as we have taken up that bread, it has drawn us closer to the relationship and fellowship we have with God and the, through the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's no mystical power in this that has changed us in any way. The juice is the same. It's a representation. It's a symbol. And so at this time, I'm going to ask Brother Bob to pray, and then we will have them pass out uh, the juice. Amen. Turn to 124. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, Lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed, 
Guard its need whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let me, like Mary, through the gloom, Come with a gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb. Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even thy cup of grief to share, Thou hast borne all for me, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. As he says in verse 25 here, after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Lord's table is an ordinance that has been given to the church, a special time in the life of the church that we have an opportunity to really express the fellowship we have one with another through the Lord Jesus Christ. So I trust it's been a blessing to you. We will uh, be closing with hymn number 221. We will be uh, taking a deacon's offering as well, an offering that uh, we will, uh, funds we use to be able to, uh, for you know, specific situations that come up. And so that we'll be doing that as we sing number 221. Oh, yes, the plate's on the back uh, table there. So uh, if you'd like to give to the Deacon's Fund, you can do that on your way out on the silver plate that's back there. It has a green bottom into it, silver and green. So 221 in your hymn books. We will close with Thank You, Lord. Are you thankful for the...